Hello, everyone. I'm Remy. I'm uh, one of the maintainers of the brain imaging data structure. I'm a postdoc in the University Catholique de Louvain. And today I'm here with Aga and Gilles, uh, who uh, are two of the leads of the um, uh, extension to BITS that was merged a little while back. That's about QMRI, and we're here to talk a little bit about that. So first, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So Aga, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Remy. Uh, I'm Aga Karakuza. I'm a PhD student at Polytechnic Montreal, and I'm working uh, lots of, on a lot of methods development for the standardization of quantitative MRI, and I'm hoping to graduate in seven months. <laughs> Great. I'm uh, Gilles de Hollander, and I'm a postdoc at the Zurich Center for Neuroeconomics. And we try to better understand how people make decisions in economic contexts, specifically about risks. And uh, I'm trying to combine it with my earlier research that's very much about the advantages of using 7 Tesla structural and functional MRI. So I'm interested in reading out sensory uh, uh, information from the cortex and also structurally imaging the subcortex. That is my main research interest. That's my day job. And during the night, I uh, I also do things like bits. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you sleep like never. <laughs> no, no, I sleep, I sleep fine. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, just just making sure. Um, okay, so um, I just sort of want to have a little chat about uh, the content of the the BEP that was merged a while back about QMRI. And I think first I would like to for you to tell me a bit of what, where it came from, um, maybe a little bit about what QMRI is and what went into this this BEP. Yeah, I think um, so. The bits extension proposal number one basically. Um, originated from my simple quest of trying to put my seven Tesla MRI seek, um, um, study into bits format. And because we use seven Tesla, um, I think primarily because of that, we use some kind of different sequences than the most standard run of the mill three Tesla fMRI studies. Specifically, because I was interested in the subcortical nodes, I was using special contrast called susceptibility weighted imaging. And also because seven Tesla comes with all kinds of problems like B1 inhomogeneities, you use often T1 weighted sequences that are a bit different uh, from the classical ones. For example, MP2 rates where you have an inversion pulse and then you uh, acquire two instead of one image and those images you combine in a particular way. And I thought it would be nice if I could put all that data online so people can see this very cool data that also many people don't have access to maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but then what happened <laughs> was that, for example, uh, an MP2 rate sequence doesn't have one, but two repetition times because there's the repetition time between the pulses, but then there's also readout blocks uh, that also have a repetition time that's much, much shorter because you have little shots to basically uh, get the actual image out of the contrast that you made with the inversion pulse. So I thought, hmm, there's only a field for repetition time. And there was, I think it was a field for inversion time, but there wasn't definitely one for the second repetition time that that you could call many things, by the way. I think in the original paper, it's something like TRMP rage or something. But anyway, it was a bit unclear what it was. So I sent a uh, email to the BITS mailing list. And from there on, um, I think Kis Gorgolevsky called it the, lar uh, the great repetition time wars of, I think it was 2017 by now. This is also way too long ago. Um, yeah, we don't have to redo it here, but it turned out that many different people, well, I think we've seen it before with bits, um, uh, that something as simple as just organizing your data, people get very emotional about that, maybe much more than about, you know, how the brain works. Like, no, 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 but this run is this, this is how you should do it. And something similar uh, happened here because people said, no, you can't do it in bits and you don't understand what the repetition time is. No, you don't understand what the repetition time is. Um, by the way, there is no such thing as repetition time. I don't know, like this, this went completely nuts, like 150 uh, mailing list uh, posts or something. And I, um, uh, 
Well, I think, well, we can talk a bit later about it, but I think what's very interesting from this whole project is that you see you have many different communities that if they say something, they mean something else. Like people that are sort of, you know, run of the mill neuroscientists that do very important work, but they're, you know, they go to SPM course and then that's, that's how they learn fMRI. So for them, the repetition time is the inverse temporal resolution, right? The longer the TR is, the longer it takes between the images I open in FSL view. Whereas if you're an MR physicist, uh, you look at M MRI from a completely different perspective, right? You have these sequence diagrams and then, yeah, the repetition time is basically how much it takes before you repeat the entire block. And it's just, that's such a fundamentally conceptually different way of thinking about things. I think that's part where the confusion came from. Um, <laughs> but from that moment on, Chris, Gorgoleski actually emailed me and said, Gilles, it seems like you know much more about this than I do. <laughs> In a good way, no, I mean, uh, because I work with this, this kind of data a lot, maybe you can start um, working on this bits extension proposal. And from there it went. And then we had a lot of um, meet, especially then Kirsty Whitaker also came aboard a little bit later. And uh, she was extremely helpful also in involving more people from the community. Because I think I wrote a little draft, but then people had comments and then Kirsty was extremely good at knowing who to invite and then starting to do these meetings. Um, yeah, maybe we can get back to that later. I think what I learned from that I think a big, big challenge for these kind of open science, open source projects is how do you, how can you be inclusive and let everyone sit at the table and everyone have their opinion, but at the same time, get things done. <laughs> That's really hard because you can meet a lot, but at some point you also need to write things down or make, you know, uh, make actual decisions. And this was a big, um, a uh, big challenge for all of us. And I think that also has something to do with that everyone, you know, I find it very important, bit extension proposal number one, but I also have 20 other things <laughs> on my to-do list or 200 things. And that's the kind of things my boss actually, you know, cares about. <laughs> and also funding agencies, right? Like I'm also a postdoc at a beginning, sort of beginning of my career. I want to stay in science. Uh, yeah, then there's only so much time that you, at least I feel that I can put into these things. And then um, this was a big challenge. Uh, but then at some point also Aga came onto the scene of, of BITS01 and BITS extension proposal number one. And that was also extremely helpful uh, also because Aga again has a different background. He's, he's a real MR physicist. He really knows what he's talking about. And uh, yeah, and he really, um, he really sort of worked further on what we did and try to make it even more generalizable. Uh, maybe he can talk better about that, but you know, maybe you shouldn't have a repetition time for inversion times with preparation pulses in general, right? It could also be um, an off, off frequency pulse or something like that. Uh, he was very um, much more equipped than a simple neuroscientist to, uh, to uh, yeah, make the next step into two bits. And yeah, at some point we had a proposal that also started to get merged into the Git repo and then things start moving in a way that you can't revert them anymore. So at some point it's part of the standard, I guess. Yeah, um, decision, you can't go back. <laughs> yeah, um, and you need that at some point, I guess. Um, so that's my part of the story. Um, yeah. Maybe Aga can tell a little bit about sure, how this yeah. was for him. How do you mm -hmm. tell us how it came how, from your point of view how the whole thing went? Yeah, I think I got involved with Bits uh, Bepo one in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, in one of the brain hack schools. Uh, my friend Elizabeth told me that they were trying to get their multi echo data bitsified. And I said, hmm, looks like something that I've been working on for the last two years. And then I just check, checked all the conversations and it was really, really interesting because I usually find myself at this intersection uh, between OHPM and ISMRM. So sometimes I need to wear my MRI physicist hat, sometimes neuroimaging analysis, uh, analyst hat, so that I was able to really actually gra grasp the gist of the, the origin of the problems, like why these discussions were happening. And I thought that I could help actually uh, solving some of them, like find that sweet spot between the die-hard MR physics approach versus the, the the widely used neuroimaging data, big data approach to that thing, and not not breaking the retrocompatibility of with with what people have been working so far. 
So yeah, that that was my uh, involvement with bits, and then I put my best effort to make everyone happy as much as possible, which is of course impossible. <laughs> and then also try try not to uh, get in the way of other applications that may share some of the concepts with parametric imaging, but not necessarily uh, generating parametric output. So yeah, I I just. Uh, was mostly for inclusivity from a technical standpoint. Uh, that's that's what that's what I was doing. Yeah, I, I really like well, like what both of you are, are saying about the the aspect that um, yeah, you're trying to get people from very different fields to talk to each other and come to a compromise and just like you know make decision. And that's I think that's one of the very hard thing about about bit and about like becoming with standards. And it seemed that it was a long journey, but in the end, you managed. So that's really really cool. Uh, yeah, and I, I do remember the the reputation time war. I mean, I was I was just a spectator, but that was that was uh, that was very instructive. That's something we, some people may not realize, and you might just be get very emotionally emotionally involved. But people on the side are learning things. So hey, at least there's that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so overall, how did you? I'm I'm just curious how how you found like the overall like. Um, extension uh, like the whole BEP process like from the Google Doc to like the whole Git thing was that was that something where that was like really painful and long was there a lot of like unanticipated difficulties or, uh, or which part actually were actually very smooth and went really well so like like the pros and cons the, the like the good the bad the ugly of the, the whole BEP process what what would you what would, what would be your take on this um, well, again, we encounter here a difficult trade-off between inclusivity, how easy is it to let anyone from the community join? Um, and the, mo the best way to do that maybe, which was the first approach, is to have these Google Docs, right? I mean, everyone knows how to open Google Doc and start putting stuff there. Um, the downside of that was that it's very hard to manage the project. Also because everyone, again, has a to-do list with 150 other things. And then you have maybe bi-weekly or monthly meetings. I, what, what, what were we doing again? Uh, yeah, and then you get these huge comment threads also in a huge Google Doc document. Um, and then at some point we moved back to GitHub and then you see that there's a reason, you know, that someone invented Git, that someone invented GitHub. And people invented things like um, version control, but also like these issues that have to be resolved at some point, code review, or in this case, uh, text review, I guess. Um, I think it was somewhat indispensable for um, getting this thing to the finish line. At the same time, I do see what you then see on GitHub is that it's really always the same five people that, uh, that care about this. Um, yeah. That's how I experienced that. Hi guys, that, is that yeah, for, for me too. Yeah, for me too. It was, I, I find it actually really frustrating to deal with a bunch of different Google Docs, addressing those comments between text. It was really messy. And then mailing lists, I was completely lost. And I was really, really happy once, once I heard that the whole thing is going to be moved to uh, GitHub. And I think especially in the last six months of Beppo one, I was really super extremely happy. Thanks to, I think, Stefan, uh, Chris, Taylor, you, Remy, you helped us a lot make this happening because later on, I noticed that many of these problem problems were actually actually because of the logistics of the issue and someone we we, we didn't actually have someone um, giving comments about the, the, the overseeing the whole thing. For example, it's really good to know for someone telling it, oh, if you do that, this is going to be a problem with this particular application. And that vision made the whole thing move much more faster than it was uh, possible before. I think if it, if it wasn't for the bits maintainers, we could have still been having meetings and discussing things <laughs> in, a, in a barren cycle. So yeah, thank you so much for all the maintainers uh, for, for this amazing effort. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, there's definitely also a lot of work there. But it was, yeah, and I think that's something I did not realize before I became a maintainer how much we like the the role of just making sure that you know you're you're always watching out for things that are going to clash and conflict, 
uh, with like when you try to integrate new elements, it's always something that um, you always have to be on the watch out. And, I mean, no one knows the specification by heart, but like by having more people and more eyes who are just specialized in subparts, then yeah, that definitely um, is necessary and is a, a, a useful thing to have. Uh, I'm glad to know it actually helps speed up the process because from my side, I was like, oh my God, we're all, we're always asking people who come to the, like with a new BEP that they need to like change a million things and they must be already exasperated and have been working on this for years and nobody asking for more changes. So glad to know that it actually helped. <laughs> but definitely, yeah, the switching to, to Git, I think, uh, is still an issue because you, you lose people, um, and it's harder to get people involved. There's a higher bar that not everyone is comfortable. <clears throat> yeah, but I think like things like brain hack and these HPM events, if you can get graduate students in there and you know try to move towards an HPM community where everyone feels comfortable working around Git and GitHub, uh, maybe that could be a potential solution. I think that helps, but I think that um, that's something I think uh, uh, Robert uh, Ostenvold has mentioned a few times was that um, you do, uh, it's not necessarily the younger and the uh, early career researchers who are the most intimidated. It might be just the uh, people who are oh. later in their career who have a lot to say and could potentially have a lot to contribute on this, but um, don't necessarily have the time to just figure out how to just contribute using um, Git and GitHub, right? So it, it's there's also a, like an aspect that um, I think we have to, to keep in mind that um, it requires time and not everyone has the time just because of where they are in their career. Um, yeah, that's that's a bit of a headache we'll have to figure out how to solve at one point. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, now that you have a BEP and that you have like, you can move all your 70 data into uh, bits, what what are you gonna do with it? I guess Aga, you have a you have a, like something on the horizon coming, but uh, more generally speaking, what are your like, your plans? What 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 does the BEP allow you to do now, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for for me, I think there are two things that I'm really interested in. First one is of course uh, coming up with all the tools that can work generate and work with this data. So I now have access to a post sequence uh, designing platform. It gives me lots of flexibility about how I collect data and how I export it. So if it wasn't for bits, I would probably just come up with my own weird uh, esoteric convention to export quantitative MRI data that no one else is going to be able to use right off the bat. So that's that's the first thing. Now I have some past sequences that exports that, that can export data in bits format. Like you type your subject entity, session entity, and all those things in the scanner console, and then you get your bits of like data and leave the scanner like that, which is beautiful. So that's that was one of the things that I want to do, and now it's possible. And the second one, of course, is that from that point on, you can come up with really good workflows that can seamlessly work with that data. And the second point is that I think the realization that the, the structural MRI is not a direct me measurement of the brain anatomy. Mm -hmm. And then if we can, make it easy for neuroimaging researchers to supplement their analysis with quantitative MRI data with this fundamental MRI parameters, then in the long run, we are probably going to be much more uh, able to find other confounders of the, 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 the um, morphometric analysis. And I think that's what I'm most excited about. And that's where I think this extension proposal is going to serve a good purpose mm -hmm. to, to bring the strength of quantitative MRI to the table for neuroimaging research because the, many of these methods are actually 35, 40 years old. Some of them are much older than I am. So <laughs> really happy to uh, make them easier to use. Yeah, the standardized format might make them way more accessible, definitely. That's for sure. <laughs> what about you, Helis? Anything on the horizon? Um, no, yeah, I, I just published this uh, research very content research on all color dominance columns where we had also very high resolution anatomical data. So I was happy I could put it on, is it open neuro now? Or yes. Like the open fMRI, yeah. The old, yeah, the old open fMRI, now open neuro. Yeah, yeah. So I could put it on there as an MP2 rage. Uh, I could put all the raw data there. That was nice. Besides that, 
yeah, I'm, I'm just doing my research happy that, that this kind of data I use that that now fits into bits. Um, I definitely don't um, have this beautiful tool that Aga has that it just rolls out of the scanner in um, bits format. Well, it's very hard to do with these experimental um, experimental sequences for a simple neuroscientist like me is is to go from the scanner console to a nice bits format. Like storing the images with the right file names is one thing, but especially getting the correct parameters that you really need, uh, that's still very hard if you're just using the standard Siemens or Philips uh, console software. I think we should be doing something about that. I don't know if I'm the person that will be able to do that or is gonna do that uh, because I also wanna understand how the brain works. But um, <laughs> yeah, I know yeah that's I think where this should go next. Um, what I would be curious to see if the Bits community can get the vendors like Philips and Siemens crazy enough to uh, <laughs> or push them to make it easier. It, it, it shouldn't be so hard, I think, uh, to, um, to make that at some point. That there's an export to bits button. I think there's a commercial product, which I now forgot the name, that claims to be able to do it. Um, nah, it's for the show notes, as they say in podcasts. But um, you, can, you can mail it to me. We'll just. We'll just <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's what should happen next, but I would I would love to hear from hear from people in the bits community if that's even possible, or what maybe would even be better if we can all migrate to open source uh, post sequence console stuff, the kind of stuff that Aga works on. But before we have that in the you know standard three T fMRI neuroimaging centers, it's going to take a while, I think. I think I think Hills, there is a movement on the vendors end for this kind of things because they are really aware of that the number of applications are really increasing, especially with the machine learning, deep learning applications, and they know that they need to keep up with these changes. So they started doing small changes to their infrastructure to be more friendly for people who like to do some post processing or doing data conversion. I think in the next five ten years of the um, open open source MRI platform development, these things are going to pick up. So right now there are five or six uh, actually open source platforms where people can design their pulse sequences and vendors are becoming more um, welcoming to this kind of approach. But the difficulty is of course, ensuring patient safety and hardware safety and those kind of aspects. But people started working on these problems on the ISMRM circles. And I mm -hmm. think a translation to OHPM can happen soon given that we have all these standards laid out before the fact. And that's the most important thing. I yeah, that would be great. But one of one of the maybe that's fun to mention. What sometimes the feedback we would get to the BEP01 thing is like, but there's DICOM. Why are you doing this? <laughs> there's no need. Yeah. Uh, and I think Philips also has a new XML format which you can output everything. Yeah. Um, why are you reinventing the wheel? And uh, I think we don't, but it's pretty hard uh, argument to. Um, I think I think we'll we'll like everybody use the same wheel which is already invented. So <laughs> nifty. <laughs> to make which it wheel? Roll quickly. <laughs> uh, but I've heard yeah. I've heard the why not use just DICOM so many times. I think I'm just going to add it to an FAQ somewhere because um, we need to have like a, a standard answer for this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the best answer always is uh, what Aga put very nicely on the poster, and he also worked on making it happen. Is the fMRI prep, fMRI prep model of you know if it's in the right format, you press play and and it yeah. works, <laughs> uh, and that with DICOM is going to be impossible to uh, achieve, yeah. I think, because there's in a way there's too much. That's all. I, now I'm for a project. I have to re recuperate what we did at some point, and then these you know. The output of this, this scanner software is always completely nuts. Yeah. Well, I'll go ahead and venture and say that like DICOM works in radiology for sure uh, when you're looking at the images. But when it comes to research, yes, it's a wheel that is invented, but I think that's a flat one because we really cannot take those parameters from multiple vendors and change it. Like all those special tags yeah but differently all those tricks like people need to sit that sit down and write three four different conversions for what just just to access the data that already exists so when it comes to research i think 
choosing not to use DICOM is not reinventing the wheel. Yeah. It's fixing the wheel. <laughs> Okie doke. I think um, we're going to wrap it up. Otherwise, we're going to go way over time for these. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. So thank you, Aga. Thank you, Hellas. Um, and ciao, everyone. And I will see you later. Well, same place, I suspect. Thank, thank you. you. Ciao.